Before I share my strategies for how you can succeed as an analyst, I think it makes sense to talk first about what success actually looks like. In other words, what are the ends that my proposed means are steering you toward? I've asked a lot of analysts in my in-person seminars the seemingly simple question of what professional success looks like to them, and I'm often surprised at how much trouble they have clearly articulating a vision of success. Part of the reason for this is that analysis does not lend itself to straightforward performance metrics. As your manager, I can't judge you on sales figures or profit or loss. Sure, I can count the number of products you write, but the numbers don't indicate impact. And if I don't get clear customer feedback, how can I actually tell what your impact even is? I'm offering a very different definition of success, one that ignores numbers altogether and addresses qualitative factors that ultimately determine your worth to your organization as a professional. My aspirational definition of success for analysts, or for any professional for that matter, is aspirational because it's very hard to achieve in full, but striving for it will serve you, your employer, and your customers well. I'm going to pose three questions, the answers to which make up what I see as a useful definition of success around which to build a healthy, productive career. The first of these questions is fairly simple but encompasses a lot of factors. Would they want to work with you again? Would others actually choose to work with you again if given the option in the future? Note that this isn't asking would they be willing to work with you again, but would they want to? The tricky part here is that the they refers to four different groups of people, and there will be times when keeping them all happy at the same time can be a delicate balancing act, particularly once you become a manager of other analysts. The first group are those customers we already talked about. Given the support they receive from you, would they want to be your customers again? This gets at the heart of your ability to produce something of value. The problem here is, as I said in the previous lecture, you'll rarely get enough feedback to know if you're meeting the standard required for your customers to want to work with you again. Let's say you're lucky enough to get frequent, rich feedback. Does that mean you can stop here and declare yourself a success? I'm going to argue the answer is no, and that a happy customer shouldn't be the sole criterion for success. For example, if you please that customer, but make all of your coworkers and yourself miserable in the process, is that really sustainable success that would be attractive to you and good for your organization? Probably not. That's why we need to ask this question about wanting to work with you again to other groups, such as the one I'll call seniors. This group includes your boss, your boss's boss, and basically anyone more senior than you where you work. Do they consider your work, your attitude, and your ability to meet their expectations favorably enough that they would want you working for them again? I can confidently say that as an analytic manager, I had a lot of analysts who failed this test because they were not skilled, didn't work hard, or had a negative attitude that brought the unit down. I did not want to work with them again, regardless of what customers might have thought about their work. The third group who should want to work with you again are your peers. These are your coworkers in your unit or other units across the organization. Their opinion of you is based in part on how competent they think you are, but how you treat them and whether they trust you can be much bigger influences on their desire to work with you again. Note that you can satisfy your customers and your boss, but be enough of an ass to your coworkers while putting in a good performance that they would definitely not want to work with you again. Having had plenty of peers like that in my career and seeing how poisonous they could be, often without seniors realizing it, I don't think they should be able to meet my standard for being a successful analyst. They will ultimately harm the effectiveness of their unit as they make others miserable. The final group who should want to work with you again are juniors. This is anyone below you in the food chain, so typically you'll only have juniors if you're a manager. Here, the challenge is how to keep your bosses happy as you drive your analysts in your analytic program while also earning the trust and respect of the very people that you're driving. I talk a lot about this tension in my leadership courses. I'll summarize my message here by saying that being able to satisfy demanding customers and bosses while also winning over the people you're pushing to do the actual work often requires a careful balancing act that analytic managers need to get right to succeed. In some cases, non-managers can have juniors too. Once you become a more senior analyst, there will be junior analysts in need of your mentoring, and dealing with them in a generous, friendly, and supportive way will affect how they see you, how they develop professionally, and how others see you as a force multiplier for your team. One important commonality I want to point out in these four groups is the word they. 
I'm saying here that what other people think about you matters to who you are as a professional. Now, if you're one of those people who proudly states that you don't care what other people think and that you're just going to be you, although such self-confidence and self-affirmation is admirable, not caring about what other people think about you, if taken too far, can and will lead to professional disaster. To succeed as an analyst, or to succeed pretty much in any profession I can think of, you need to care what other people think about you. If they don't see you as trustworthy, fair, respectful, or competent, then you have a real problem. As I'll discuss later, being an analyst almost always means being part of a team and requires working horizontally and vertically within an organization, whether it's a government agency or a private sector firm. If others see you as problematic, it will always hinder your ability to get the job done and to advance, regardless of what you think about yourself. It will also undermine your team's success. So far, my aspirational definition of success has been based on external perceptions of your performance and ability to work well with others. In my next lecture, I'm going to expand my definition and add two elements that relate just to you.